Okay, hi, my name is Tarin, and uh, today I will talk about Mio uh, Kusihiji recognition smartphone application with AI. But actually, I will uh, talk about Kusihiji recognition in overall, and then at the end, I will show you the um, the demo of the recent version of Mio. The application, the app is not uh, released yet, but I'm trying to release it as soon as possible. So uh, anyway, let's get started. My background is actually classical Japanese literature. I got my PhD in the tale of Genji, um, which is like a, the literature from a thousand years ago uh, from Waseda University in 2017. But before I got my PhD, I started uh, machine learning research on Kusiji recognition at the University of Tokyo in uh, 2017. And then I got a uh, start working for CODS or Center for Open Data in the Humanities in uh, 2018. And then uh, I developed a Kuronet AI based Kusiji recognition system in the same year. And then in 2019, I hosted a CACL machine learning competition for Kusiji recognition. And in 2021, I developed the, the first version of MIO Kusiji recognition for a uh, smartphone application. So uh, as you already know that Japan is a unique country with, uh, with one of the most distinctive culture. We have uh, so many things like food and art and yeah, every, every other knowledge that um, preserved inside the book. So over a thousand years of Japanese history and knowledge are in the documents and books. Um, but uh, we, even though we have over a billion historical documents and books are preserved nationwide, but most Japanese cannot read them anymore. Only 0.01% of the population. This is because Kusiji are cursive Japanese. So uh, you may think that maybe um, cursive Japanese, like cursive uh, English or something like that, but actually is uh, a little bit harder than that because uh, when you see uh, on the left side is the Kusiji and on the right side is the modern Japanese uh, transcription. If you know some Japanese, you can see that maybe the first characters on the on the image here is like, uh, it looks the same as the one in the modern characters. But then when you go to the next character on the left and you can see that it looks completely different from the modern Japanese character. So uh, some of them look similar, some of them look different. And that's why if you, uh, if the reader don't have the knowledge in how to read Kusuichi, they cannot um, read this check as, at all. And um, one reason that most people cannot read is because they don't have Kusiji education in school. But uh, the thing is, uh, Kusiji has so many rules that doesn't exist in uh, modern Japanese anymore. For example, for the kanji or Chinese character, there used to be so many ways to write only just one character like this. But then for hiragana, which is a phonetic character for Japanese, there used to be so many ways to write, like uh, use so many characters to represent this one character in the modern Japanese. So it's like the many to one relationship between uh, Kusiji R to the modern Japanese. So even though uh, Japan has been using Kusiji for over a thousand years from like uh, a century to early uh, 20th century, but after that, there's non Kusiji period. Uh, I mean, like uh, from uh, 20th century until now, it's not, Kusiji is not used anymore. The reason is that there is a standardization of the Japanese language textbook in 1900 that standardized everything that they just uh, get rid of the character that they, they think uh, the Japanese government, they thought is uh, redundant or maybe it's hard to read. And they try to adapt uh, cursive Japanese into like modern printing system because uh, you know, like if you write it's like a connected all the way to, it will be really hard to use the modern printing on something like that. So they did a huge standardization and what they changed is the uh, textbook for elementary school students. So that's why um, they try to, uh, they teach the new way of the Japanese to, uh, to uh, elementary school students. And then uh, it's just the Kusiji just get like uh, disappear over time. So when you look at the book like this, and this is Alice in Wonderland. So uh, it's printed in uh, 19th century. If you read this, in you know English, right? And then, then you can read this very, very easily. It's just like uh, the language. It's not that different from today. But when you look at the Japanese book, 
that printed in the same period. If you go uh, out and walk and you ask Japanese people to read this page, this page of book, if you ask like 100 people, if you are lucky, maybe one person can read it. But most of the time, it's like a 100 out of 100, nobody can read this anymore. So if Japanese people cannot read a historical document, how do they learn about their history? The thing is like, uh, we have a lot of historical documents and then we have the expert to transcribe and read those texts. And after that, the expert will write the books or maybe academic paper, and then the general public will learn from these books and the paper. And there's no way that the non-expert, you can get directly access to the information in the historical document. So it's always go like this. The problem is experts, they are like us, they are researchers, they have limited the time, they have something that they're interested in, they have something that they're they are not interested. So what if they're not interested in those documents, like a, a big pile of book or something that almost looks like a trash, it's not, it's a historical document, it's like a, it's in very bad condition, something like that. For, for me, like I'm a literate, uh, classical Japanese literature researcher, I only read the tale of Genji. Anything outside the tale of Genji, I don't know because I never really read it. So uh, the amount of book that the general public can read historical documents in Japan is very limited by um, the interest of the expert in the field. And the, another problem is that, as you know, uh, Japan has a lot of disaster all the time. We lost historical document from disaster all the time, like uh, in uh, 2019 or something like that. The whole uh, collection room of the Kawasaki City Museum was destroyed by typhoon or something like that. We try to rescue those documents. We try to um, fix it. We try to preserve everything. But then, um, yeah, we still lost it a lot over time. The thing is, when we think about like uh, try to preserve this kind of historical document, the first thing that we think of is to digitize the manuscript and the rare books, right? Just to uh, take the picture or scan the document. And then, yeah, every, everywhere right now in Japan, they are trying like uh, in the uh, Professor Kitamoto's presentation that National Institute of Japanese Literature is trying to um, digitize like uh, 300,000 books set I would say book set because in one, in one set it can have like 10 to 100 books inside, um, 300,000 book set and then just take a scan the books, take a picture of the book like that. And then for example, in the Tenri uh, Central Library in Nara, they have over uh, 22 million images that uh, in their archive. And that's only one uh, library. We have a lot, like a uh, hundred and uh, hundreds of library and museum in Japan. And, we end up with a lot of image, a lots of lots of image that has taken inside, and there is no easy way to access to the content of the book. So even though we have the image, we still have to read the books one by one just to find the uh, information inside those document. So this is the um, the beginning why uh, they try everyone try to use a machine to transcribe because this is not a new research project, but. Um, it start to get a, a good result, like uh, being successful in recent year. One thing is because of the computational power of the computer, like a GPU and so on. And another thing is the data set because um, National Institute of Japanese uh, Literature released a big data set on Kusuhiji. That's why um, we can start using this data set to train the machine learning model to uh, transcribe Kusuhiji. So in the Kusiniji data set, there's a data like this. So we have like the whole page image of the book. We have, uh, I think we have about 8,000 mm, 8, pages of the Kusiniji document like this. And in each page, we have like each character's label in uh, CSV or in CSV file like this. Each character is a, a label by Unicode. And then we have bounding box with X, Y, W, H coordinate. And we use this information to, um, to train the model to transcribe this. So from Kuronet, uh, we developed a Kusiniji recognition model called Kuronet. We is an end to end model that uh, can transcribe Kusiniji characters in uh, 1.2 seconds per page. But actually, the time is very up to like uh, how many characters 
are in that page. If the character is super dense, and then it will take longer time than that, but average is like 1.2 seconds. And Chrome that has like a 90% accuracy with a 90, uh, 0.9 F1 score on the test data. But the thing is the test data doesn't represent the whole documents in the world. Um, we can get very high results in the test data, but maybe when we, we apply it to the real world data, it's gonna be different. So this um, accuracy is just a reference that uh, how Kronet uh, does comparing to other model. And we use Kronet because uh, we developed this model in 2018 and in 2019, we uh, hosted the Kaggle competition, use Kronet as the baseline. I will talk about this uh, in a few moments. So uh, when we look at the when we look at the standard character recognition process, we have uh, in normal. It, this one is not Kronet, but in the standard recognition process, we have the image, and then the first thing that they will do is to do layout analysis, like uh, to see like uh, where is the characters, where is the image, and then try to see where is the column, where is the whole the row of the characters. And then the next process is a character segmentation is to cut each character like a one a column at a time. And then at the end, if you just go to the character recognition, this is standard character recognition process. But for Kusiji, this process doesn't work very well. The reason is that um, the layout in Kusiji historical document is very, very hard because in Japanese, they always write um, they can write it in the row and the, the layout can be completely different because they use the whole block of wood to carve everything and then print it. So the layout can be anything that they want. They didn't use, uh, they used movable font uh, sometime before, but it wasn't very popular. So we have a few books in the movable font, but uh, most of the time they use like the whole wood block to print the book. And because um, the layout in Kusiji is very hard. So if you go from the image to layout analysis, then you will stuck at the layout analysis. So Kronet uh, try to think ab about that problem in different way. So this is the standard, uh, right? But uh, the standard uh, procedure of the character recognition. But what we try to do, because the layout analysis and character segmentation is hard, so we just cut it off like this, and then we go from the image to the character recognition, and then we put layout analysis in after that, and then we get the text output after we get the layout analysis. So we could do this because we used, uh, oops, sorry. So we use this uh, object detection algorithm. As you can see that uh, the, the algorithm tried to this YOLO V3, but we didn't use YOLO V3, but uh, I just want to give the idea that uh, we can detect the um, each object on the image or video like this and then get the label of that. So Kronet used the same similar approach. So when you look at the Kronet algorithm, it's something like this. This is the uh, record about damage around Hibiakomong in the Great Ansai Earthquake in 19th century. So uh, what Kronet does is that it uh, receives this uh, image and then the first thing it will try to locate where the character is like this. So it's the, this is the bounding box generated by the model. And then in each bounding box, we just uh, try to transcribe to the modern Japanese. This one can be used something super simple like a uh, normal CNN or mobile net or anything. The problem is that we have to get the location of the character and then we put it in the um, character recognition model something like this. And then, so even though it's the, the result is not that perfect, but it's overall more than 90%, it, it can give like the readers about uh, what this tech is about comparing to something like this that people cannot read it at all. So uh, we use Kronet as a baseline model for Kaggle uh, Kusiji recognition competition in uh, 2019. So uh, we hosted uh, the competition for three months, which is standard for Kaggle. And uh, there were about 300 participants uh, participate in this competition. We have a prize money of uh, 15,000 US dollar. And about the competition design, I want to talk about this briefly. The, um, the thing is, we know exactly what we want from the start in this competition. Most of the time that uh, in the digital humanities project, the problem is that they don't have the clear uh, question, research question for that project. But for us, it was clear that we want any model that beat Kronet. 
basically in the same metric and the same data. So uh, we make the task easy to understand, uh, to simplify everything and make this a clear metric. And then anyone who, uh, even though they don't know Japanese or Kusiji, they can participate. This is done by data preparation and the rules that uh, we decide. For example, like uh, for the data preparation, we remove the ambiguous uh, characters and uh, try to give it the like a, uh, Sometimes even human cannot read that, but we try to uh, decrease that kind of the, um, the data that uh, we can get like a, at least 90% um, accuracy or something like that. And the result is something like this. We got, because it's a competition, there are so many people participate in it. And the good thing is when we have a competition, we can test like hundreds of algorithms on the same data at the same time. And you can see that the first one is HRNet with the cascade RTNN that get, get uh, F1 score of 0 0.95. And then the second one is uh, faster RTNN with the ResNet backbone and classified with ResNet uh, 101, something like that. And you can see that Kernet is <laughs> it's got at 11 place. So uh, there are so many uh, models that's better than Kernet right now. So. Uh, the thing is, uh, we got so many, we got so many like uh, algorithm now. But the problem is, even though we try to adjust the algorithm, we have like a lot of people try to solve the same question, the same pro research problem. Maybe we can adjust the model and get maybe zero point five percent higher accuracy than what we already have right now in here. But the problem is, should we focus on developing like a new algorithm to try to get higher, uh, higher accuracy from the same data? Or another approach is that we get enough models already. Can we try to increase the data to make the models be able to generalize with other that type of document better? So uh, that's the, uh, what we are thinking right now. And for the Kuronet service, we released, after we got the Kuronet and we are done with the CACO, we released the Kuronet service on IIIF Creation Viewer. The IIIF Creation Viewer is the, the platform that uh, CODS developed like uh, in the uh, Kitamoto, uh, Professor Kitamoto's presentation. Um, the thing is, even though we already have the models and that, where is the software, we get like asked all, every day, like, uh, I want to use Kuronet, how can, how, how can I use it? Um, I have the documents in my hand or something like that. But the problem is curiosity recognition model is object detection is computationally expensive, especially if you want to get enough, high enough accuracy. And then you need to know how to run Python script on Ubuntu terminal and also set up environment dependency and everything. It's not easy for like uh, people who are not researcher, who are not machine learning researcher and um, who are like a, a lot of old people want to use uh, this model. So we are thinking about, okay, if people cannot set up the GPU and everything by themselves, can, do, can we do the machine learning on the server? Like uh, we send the image to the server and then the server uh, GPU transcribe the model and then send the response to the user. So this is what uh, we try to do using the IIIF Curation Viewer as uh, Kitamoto, uh, Professor Kitamoto mentioned that uh, museum library and archive released uh, their images through IIIF. Um, the way to do is, is that the user used a IIIF Curation Viewer and then they get the image from museum libraries through this Curation Viewer. And then the Curation Viewer will send uh, the request to the server to do uh, transcription and then send the response, the re result back to the creation viewer and then to the user like this. So the prob another problem that we have afterward is that what if the documents are not in IIIF format, right? Because uh, for example, if you go to uh, inside your house, you have the document in Kusiji and you want to do this and it's not on triple A if it's just uh, you have the document in your hand, what you are going to do. And um, this is why I decided to develop new Kusuhiji recognition smartphone application. So the reason that I developed this app is that Kronet is hard to use in the real world situation. I want a lot of people, we develop the, uh, the recognition model and I want like a lot of people to be able to use it easily. And um, 
anywhere that they want. But uh, when we have the document and we take the picture, most of the time we take picture with our smartphone, like uh, our iPhone or Android or anything. And then uh, we want to transcribe that. Even I, before I start um, develop this app, I had to take a picture of the document and then I connect it to send it to maybe Google Drive and then uh, connect it to my phone, my using a uh, AirDrop or something, and then to my computer. Or, but uh, my computer cannot uh, is um, on Mac. Is I have to uh, transfer it to the my Ubuntu desktop and then just transcribe it. So it's a lot of. It's very hard even uh, for me. It's not that easy to use. So uh, I try to do this directly on the phone. So uh, when you think about like smartphone uh, app development, I didn't have like a a lot of experience in this either. I started learning about this like last year. And when you talk about smartphone, we have like a iOS and Android, like main of that. And then uh, we also have tablet, maybe iPad on Android tablet. The thing is, it's different OS, different screen size. How can we like build something that support uh, all of this kind of device? So when you want to build a mobile native app, for Android, we use Kotlin or Java, and for iOS, is a, uh, we use Swift. And I used to think that maybe I should learn like uh, maybe Kotlin to build an uh, Android app, but the thing is I'm an iPhone user. I want also to use uh, my app on, on my own phone. So it's, this is a very hard uh, decision to think. And then after I look, I found that uh, Google developed a framework called Flutter. And the Flutter can develop iOS and Android app at the same time. And also like uh, it can expand to the desktop and web app in the future. And it can be used uh, on the smartphone and on the tablet at the same time. And the language that is used is only one language, which is Dart. Dart is a programming language that is uh, very similar to Java. It's just a, like a standard. Uh, programming language is not that hard. Um, there's a lot of uh, widgets and library to choose from. And for machine learning, we can do both on device and off device. I use mainly off device on the server, but for the uh, on device, we also have like a TF Lite that uh, even though it's not uh, not support uh, a lot of model at the moment, but uh, yeah, it can be like uh, useful in the future. So uh, when we started uh, like uh, developing the smartphone app, what you need is a Flutter framework. It's free to uh, download from Flutter website. And then uh, we developed it on the Android Studio or VS Code, which is also free. And if you want to work on iOS device, you just need Xcode. So you need a Mac computer and it's free if you already have a Mac and then device for testing. Normally I just use my phone. So the, the concept of me or app is not that hard. It's, uh, it's just like uh, when user take the picture of the document and send to the server and the server uh, run Kuronet model and give the results to in JSON to uh, the mobile phone. So this is the, uh, the video that I took from uh, KO Museum Common uh, a few months ago. So this is the app on the iPad, but uh, I'll show you the demo on the iPhone a few minutes later. So it's just something like this. We take the picture of the, uh, the this is like a, the screen with procedure characters. And then uh, we take the picture and do recognition on the server and send result back like this. And when you click on the uh, characters, it will highlight the same character on the same page in the, in the same image. Okay, so, uh, oops. So that's all for uh, my uh, presentation. I will show you the demo right now. So uh, I will uh, start sharing another screen. Okay, uh, so it's done. So this is the app and then uh, it go to the title screen. And this is a user agreement that we have to uh, build, but this is just like uh, the demo text right now because uh, yeah, because we use the photo, we have to uh, ha set the privacy policy for the user before uh, we can upload it on the server. So this is the main screen of Mio. What you can do is that you can choose like uh, maybe the document from the album like this. And then you just click at the recognition and it, this will send the image to the server and then get the recognition result. And you can uh, choose to show the 
uh, result like this using a slider on here, uh, this uh, this button also works like this. And then when you click at the same uh, on the characters on this page, it will highlight the same characters if there's some in here, like this, this is all the same characters. And then when we click at the bottom on, on here, which is a text input, this uh, this is a text input that we can like copy and uh, we can also share on like a other with the other software on the on the mobile phone and then you can add the comment like this like uh, okay this is the sample yes like this and then add it will just like uh yeah save on the phone and you can also delete the one that you don't want by just a slide like this and when you go back to this you can get the result from the recognition and then uh, what I try to add more is that uh, the sample image, like uh, if you don't have the PGG document in your hand, you want to uh, read some books, then uh, try to add the sample books in here. And another function that I try to add before um, release this app is that I want to make user be able to uh, edit the result and then save it and use it on their own because the the model is not always 100% correct. And yeah, there's, uh, the release is, uh, I, I try to release it like uh, at the end of August. So it's uh, a lot of work right now ongoing, but yeah, I hope this will be able, to, uh, we'll be able to release for people to download very soon. Okay, so that's all for my uh, presentation. Thank you.